for focused support to ensure their future. Uh, this has placed youth at the forefront of climate emergency, leading to global mobilization and creating platform for youth to participate in climate discourse. Decision makers should facilitate this participation in a sustained, formalized manner for better implementation of cl uh, climate plans. And to discuss today why and how uh, can we increase youth representation in climate discourse? I have a stellar lineup of panelists with me. But first, um, I would um, go to Raymond. Uh, Raymond, the youth of 2030 in the Global South will be in their peak earning period by 2050. Uh, this is when some of the worst uh, impact of climate change are projected to hit the developing world. And mainstreaming youth and climate action, as I just mentioned, must sit at the heart of multilateral cooperation. Um, you are the founder, South African BRICS Youth Association. Uh, BRICS countries have significant variations in their interest with respect to climate action due to their uh, differing production and consumption patterns. How do you think can youth play a role in building convergence among BRICS in climate action, and what do you think are the challenges? But just before you start, uh, may I request all our panelists to keep their first round of interventions between three to four minutes in the interest of time. Raymond, to you. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just before I begin there, I just want to reflect on some of the keynote speakers that um, um, were discussed in the morning. and. Um, the, the chair of ORF indicated that um, we, we need to have a new, um, or to sign a new agreement uh, with the planet. Uh, and he defines it as the triple P, people and planet partnership. And I think uh, that's the approach that we need to, uh, to all take. He also emphasized that uh, we need to come up with five to 10 concretized uh, solutions um, out of this session to be um, sent to the uh, G20 Sherpa and the leaders for consideration. And I, I do hope that um, in the panel uh, where we're going to give some of these solutions, at least one or two of them makes it to that platform. And maybe just before I start with the conversion, let me start with the challenges. Um, the biggest challenge that youth have around the globe is around um, a political power as well as um, being involved in decision-making processes. We all talk about youth uh, being the future and you know having to uh, be the ones that are going to um, deal with the issues of climate action and, and other economic issues in the future. However, um, we are not involved in decision-making processes. So that is the biggest challenge. Um, and I'll give you an example. I, I also get involved, I'm also involved in the G20. 2018, I led uh, the South African delegation to Argentina um, as the Y20 delegate for South Africa. One of the issues we discussed was sustainable development, and that includes, included uh, um, uh, climate action. Throughout these years, Y20 has been sitting for 12, this year will be 13 years. Of all the recommendations that we've proposed to the BRICS, uh, to the G20 leaders, none of them, you can go today, none of them have been implemented. And therefore, we will always remain by the way and be sidelined as a talk show. Maybe then quickly on, on some of the convergence is to really get um, uh, education and awareness. I mean, we, in the Global South particularly, we look at uh, the majority of the people are marginalized, they are in rural areas, and they know nothing about climate change and climate action. And what is the purpose and the role that the media must play in ensuring that uh, this information is... Also, what is the purpose of our education system? We're talking about climate change, but if you go to the educational curriculum of, of the Global South, it has nothing to do with the future, but it simply teaches people theoretical issues about uh, what needs to be done. Maybe lastly, colleagues, uh, due to time, I also want to, to touch briefly on um, what the chief minister said, is how do we create 
um, uh, green economy because you can't talk climate action uh, without economy because uh, you're looking at the livelihoods of people and so forth. And also, between the global north and the global south, uh, what is the convergence there? How can we work around some of the imbalances of the past uh, to introduce the just transition uh, going forward? Thank you so much. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, because we are speaking about cooperations between a uh, country, uh, let me uh, come to uh, Mehjbeen uh, Khaled. We, uh, we, you know, Bangladesh and India have a huge history of development cooperation. Uh, now, given both India and Bangladesh have an exponentially growing startup ecosystem that is run by the young population, and a, a significant number of them are uh, focused on climate initiatives. How can we explore partnership and cooperation between the startups of the two countries towards innovation, climate tech, for mitigating climate change and empowering green transition? Thank you, Aparna. Uh, thank, uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, usually after lunch, nobody wants to sit and listen to anybody. But I can see the speakers are so eager to learn more about what everybody is doing, it's nice to see everybody is awake and listening to us. Um, actually, I, I will tell everybody that I'm very lucky because as a member of parliament from 2014 to 2018, uh, I was there as policymaker. So I've seen that part. And then again, uh, my constituency is my hometown. Uh, it's in Jamalpur. So every year we see a flash flood so I see people suffering, and especially the youth, and uh, they suffer a lot. And it's a first hand going there, grassroots level, seeing what they're doing. So that is one, one side. And the second side now, after, uh, the, after being a member of parliament right now, I'm working with young uh, youth uh, on climate change uh, as social work. So this is both sides I'm working. So I know a little bit from both sides, you know? So when I was in the parliament, I thought we were doing everything. But when I came to grassroots level as a social worker, I saw actually very little is happening. In the grassroots, nobody knows anything. But I would say uh, 15, 20 years back, when somebody would have said climate change is an issue, I would have said, what is climate change? But nowadays, the young people are teaching us. It's a movement. They are talking to us. Even at home, my children are telling me there is something called climate change. And right now is the time for the government to listen. And it's not only government can do something, it's everybody has to do. And India, Bangladesh, we have such old history, culture, and we are surrounded by India. So we have to work together, especially Meghalaya. They are doing such wonderful job because before coming here, I was looking into it that what they're doing on climate change, so many things, and there's so much to learn, but our young youth, they don't even know. So we can use technology, digital, because in COVID we understood that uh, through uh, digitally, we can be connected. So nobody has to come here. We can be connected somehow and use the technology for green, uh, green um, climate. So some of the things like points I just want to touch, one is like connect youth groups and clubs with experienced mentors, professionals and experts. Uh, mentorship programs can provide guidance, support and opportunities for growth and facilitate knowledge sharing, peer learning and exchange of ideas. And best practices among the climate activists and at the end, I like to add funding. That is the most important thing. We have to bring private sector and charitable organization and our development partners because when they do fund something, the youth are excluded there. And we have to uh, think gender issue also in that aspect. So these are the things I wanted to say. But again, when you come back, we'll discuss more. Thank you. Sure, Mahajadeen. I would be very happy to learn about, uh, you know, how the startup ecosystems of the countries can engage more from you. I'll come back on that. But because we have touched upon on multilateral cooperation and bilateral partnerships, I would now want to focus on the countries of the region at the national level. 
Um, so, Shanaki, I want to come to you now. And uh, we know that as Sri Lanka is rec recovering right now from an acute economic crisis, uh, but how can it effectively channel youth capital towards uh, green jobs as a mean to mitigate climate crisis the, versus the other livelihood opportunities available? Thank you. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Think20 India for, in fact, giving um, a significant number of youth to be panelists uh, on this panel that um, involves youth participation, because generally you see a lot of panels where you don't have youth, uh, but uh, we are being told what we should do. So um, I'd like to resonate with what the Chief Minister said this morning. Uh, the Chief Minister, in fact, said it's about how the economy, uh, economic uh, development and climate change, both these things are essential. And, and I think both of them go hand in glove, so I'm glad that you asked me that question. The only way, let's be honest, for developing countries or countries in Asia mostly, Climate change is something that we actually believe should, that we should participate in. We want to contribute positively. We want our countries to be carbon uh, neutral at least, if not carbon negative. But however, we have day-to-day -day challenges uh, because in terms of my own country, uh, there's rampant sand mining happening. That is because the youth, num large number of youth depend on sand mining as a main livelihood uh, measure. Sri Lanka has a large uh, population of people who um, engage in agriculture. So deforestation happens because they need more land to cultivate. Sri Lanka is an ocean surrounded by, uh, you know, Sri Lanka is an island surrounded by the ocean. So large number of illegal fishing uh, means are taken, uh, take place in Sri Lanka because that considerably is, uh, contributes to the livelihood. So the only way that climate change would be successful one of the most productive ways would be if climate change can also be monetized. Excuse me for saying that. If it's only made into a, looked at it from a business perspective, I think it will be a success here. So I think Meghalaya is um, a good example on how uh, they're doing it. 14,000 youth have been uh, engaged in uh, projects where they're, uh, you know, they're actually paying for people to have for us. So I think things like carbon credit, I think carb things like carbon credit, if you look at cryptocurrency, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it was unheard of. But now cryptocurrency can be, uh, you can deal in transact with cryptocurrency uh, on an online platform. So involving youth and um, using things like carbon, I'm sure the uh, distinguished audience, everyone is aware of what carbon credits are. So if we can come up with a platform or a system, even for my country, which is a tropical country where, you know, it will be an ideal place for, you know, uh, Im Im implement carbon credit. I think that'll be a good way to, if we can use modern technology, use the use of apps, uh, it'll be a great way to uh, monetize climate change, which will be uh, one of the best ways to make it successful. So in that sense, I'd like to actually thank the government of India also to taking on this role as the uh, chair of the G20 this year um, for giving not just the Southeast Asian region, but leadership to the entire Asian region in terms of climate change and act as a mediator uh, as act as a um, act as an in between person with the most people who uh, emit carbon and also to uh, for people who can produce uh, carbon credit. So I think giving leadership to a region does not just mean giving money and loans. It's also looking after the future generations, looking after my generation. So once again, I'd like to thank uh, Think Twenty Foundation for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Um I would now go to Nepal. Um, Yogesh, around 59% of the population of Nepal is below 30 years. Uh, so how can Nepal leverage its youth capital to harness the potential of the natural wealth through these new ideas such as eco-prendership? Uh, Thank you. A very warm good afternoon to everyone present here. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having us and putting us into this vibrant contemporary discussion. Uh, first of all, what I would like to mention is the place where I'm sitting right now and the country I belong have a lot of things in common. 33 million Population in Meghalaya covers 80% of forest area, whereas 
we have 10 folds ahead of population, 33 million population in Nepal covers 40% uh, percent of forest area. And the main thing common in this achievement in these two country or areas, uh, the active participation of local indigenous community and community-based forest management. And I would like to cherish and celebrate this common uh, achievement which we both share. And having said that, the Nepal is a very young and vibrant country. And we are sitting at a juncture where we are facing three major problems. We, Nepal has to marry three critical climate sensitive issues. First, we need to achieve the economic growth as well. At the same time, we need to address the climate sensitive issues as well. And the other one being, uh, we need to be actively or proactively involved in mitigating these climate sensitive issues as well. And since our younger population, we are not able to retain in our own country, since Nepal is a remittance driven country, uh, five million, more than five million youths are outside Nepal. And it's a challenging role and job for us to incentivize those five million people who are out of our country when they head back to our country with uh, some special experience they gain over the years, how to pool and use those human capitals in achieving a nature-friendly solution towards achieving uh, economic growth. But uh, I would like to assure you all that the source for our economic growth, which happens to be tourism, mainly eco-tourism, and agriculture, and hydropower, these major sources are clean source of uh, economic growth. Hence, we need not need to worry much, but Nepal is very unique country in terms of tourism. So in ecotourism, we must focus on how to unfold the potential of climatic and biosensitive tourism through which we can leverage most out of it. And in terms of agriculture, we need to modernize the agricultural practices which we have been doing in a more sensitive and more eco-friendly approach. And hydropower, since we are the second largest source for hydropower, and we are not, we are not able to leverage it much, but over the decades, we have been doing well exponentially in this regard as well. So uh, lastly, Nepal is recently federated country since 2015, and a lot of activities are going around at the grassroots levels. Some dynamic mayors, like uh, I would like to quote the mayors of Kathmandu, uh, Balen Saha, and some mayors of Dharan Municipal uh, Council, uh, they are very young and they have, uh, they have put forward some of the iconic and eco-sensitive projects at the very sub-national level. Once it, it, is, it succeeds and we have uh, implemented it as a pilot project, then we need to maximize it to national and even if practices are best proven and eco-friendly, then we can even extend it to the international forum as well. And I would like to submit by uh, keeping my points to this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now, now I'd like to come down or add, uh, to focus on the local level. Avner, coming to you, um, we are already celebrating Meghalaya's commitment towards uh, climate resilience in action. Um, and I don't know how many of us know, but the state had trained about 14,000 young men in forest management, thereby creating a unique environment cadre and frontline workers who are trained in conservation and forest preservation. Uh, 
how can these foundations, you think, be scaled up and serve as a template that could be adopted by other regions? Thank you so much, uh, Aparna. Um, I think that if you look at, um, as uh, many of our panelists have said, the allocations, the budgetary allocations also have been very high. And uh, that is a step in the right direction. I think if we want to upscale anything, funding is very, very crucial. So there have been, uh, over the next five years, I think the payment for eco-services will be getting around 250 crores over the next five years. And that, that is a step in the right direction. I, I think we can do better. I think we can augment it, make it a little bit more um, enticing, incentivize our communities much more. Because uh, obviously that's, that's something that all of, everyone has been talking about. Everyone is looking at the very real issue of how do you convince people that this is a good thing? Because at the local level, this might not be an issue. They, don't, they may not even see this as an issue. So that is always a challenge. I think, uh, as I've said, funding is very, very crucial. Um, allocating for this, thinking about um, you know, I, I know you have a panel tomorrow as well, but thinking, really seriously thinking about a Green New Deal, thinking about how we can make this work, make it lucrative also for people who are involved in, the, in this new transition. And it can't be piecemeal. It'll have, to be, it'll have to be radical, it'll have to be quite fast. Because there is a very, very real threat here. I mean, which we, we might not be really uh, appreciating, but I think many people in in various countries, especially in islands, and they would actually be really, really at the forefront. And we need to really be thinking together, because it's not just uh, South Africa, Nepal, India, blah blah blah. You know, we are all in this together. We all have to develop collective strategies for how to tackle these problems. And um, I think funding, budgetary allocations, that is very very important. We also have to be very creative, right? Because we can't do what we've been doing for a very long time. The same things can't apply anymore. So, you know, I, I can't start to talk about the Green New Deal because I'm not a trained economist, but having read what I have read online, whether it's from, other, from various parts of the world, various itinerations of the Green New Deal, that is something I feel would be very, very important. And I think a state like Meghalaya also is poised to do that because they have been taking steps in the right direction. Uh, but again, there's always room for improvement because there's a, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are really, you know, we, we are racing against a doomsday clock. And that's, that's not an exaggeration, we really are. And a lot of the countries uh, where we are from, we are, we are really, really in a bad situation. We can't deal with the pollution that we are, we're putting out there. Forget about the West. We can always talk about how much they are polluting, but we also have to do our part and actually handle what we are unable to handle. That will require a lot of creativity, and that will require a lot of very serious efforts, not just you know, talk shop all the time. It will require a real transition. And uh, since we're talking about youth, the youth have to engage with this very real fact that there are real obstacles to this transition. And those are political obstacles also, because the ones who are holding on to power, money, they have been doing th these things for a very long time. They're not going to budge just because a bunch of young people come out and say that we want to change. And I think this we are seeing reflection of this in various parts of the world. There have been many, many agitations, many, many riots, protests about this. And uh, this is something that will keep continuing unless the power structure has changed. And for me, I think here in Meghalaya also, we have to do something like that. Thank you. So those have been the first very insightful round. I had a second round, but I have, I have another good idea. Uh, we all have um, uh, focused on a lot of challenges in mainstreaming youth in uh, climate narratives, actions, uh, decision making, and international processes. Why don't we uh, put ourselves, all of you, um, on the shoes of a G20 presidency? Suppose each one of you are a G20 presidency now. Uh, 
in that sense, what would be your two-point recommendation be uh, or action agendas that you would recommend uh, that would ensure a step forward, a huge step forward in integration or mainstreaming of youth in decisive climate action? Raymond, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Look, for me, really, it will be uh, one thing, getting youth involved in the table and literally in the table making those decisions. Secondly is putting the money where the mouth is, is how do you then invest in youth-led initiatives that deals with climate change? That would be the two things that I would go. Thank you. Great, I think you're taking the rapid fire very seriously. <laughs> Over to you, Shanak. So I'd like to complete what I started earlier. Um, good opportunity. I would first of all um, document. Now I know for some countries are carbon negative right now. So first of all, document the countries that are carbon ne negative and actually the bad boys, the polluters uh, of our uh, uh, world, the globe, and document them first and then have a system where just like I mentioned, monetize, um, you, know, you know, carbon credits is, you know, it, it, it goes both ways. It could also be an agriculture initiative as well. So get a, get a whole, um, whole group of countries together. There are many countries who are actually, I know for an instance, there, I'm not going to mention a country, but one country actually thought carbon climate change would be just to grow trees. And I think they went ahead and planted a large number of trees in an African country. And the year, a few years after, they had to spend 10 times more to get rid of those trees because, in fact, those trees were causing more damage to... Uh, the globe, then they actually do it good. So therefore, actually come up with a, a system uh, and identify the good ones and the bad ones and where we actually need to make change and then give them a plan. That will be a, um, a global plan. At least, at least come up with a group of countries who would like to participate in this first. We can't force everybody to participate, uh, but at least get a group of countries to uh, participate. Because saying give the youth uh, the opportunity to do it or empower youth, but in fact, the real decision makers, you know, the youth, we, we, have to, we can only participate in the decisions that are being made for us right now. Let's be realistic. So those are my recommendations. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Khalid, two points. Um, I think uh, with Raymond, I, I'm going to agree with him. Decision making, but there's a problem. Because when youth are going to the grassroots level, start with grassroots level, when they're going to the leaders, Leaders think they know everything. So what are the youth thinking? So that's the problem that I think there needs to be a change also to listen to them. That's not one thing. Another thing is collective decision. Um, if we do collective strategy with India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, the, far, uh, the Southeast Asia, that like where the BIMSTEK, SARC, everybody comes, that's very important, so we can all share the same thinking process. Thank you. Um, for me personally, as I said, I think uh, you need to be engaged more with, like, there, there's so many things that they are actually talking about. They won't know everything, but that's where you need to have some sort of hand-holding, some, sort of, some sort of interactions. And I'm talking about a very localized level here. It has to be at the community level. You know, sometimes the older people, like I'm, I'm an in, indigenous person myself, so sometimes a lot of people who are, you know, older, they might have done certain things which we can then innovate upon. I think learning from the past, learning from history is very, very important. We we can't just be so arrogant to think that we've just come out on this earth now and we know everything. No, of course not. That we, we can't afford to keep repeating mistakes of the past. So I would definitely have more, you know, maybe they could be called trainings or workshops across the board, trying to develop these solutions locally. Um, again, involving young people in political uh, decision making. Getting, I think that one thing that's really missing is political education. I think that is very, very important. And it is connected with uh, how you want to think about your future. So we don't want a planet that's always on fire. So it, it stands to reason that this is what will happen eventually if you involve them in uh, political 
decision making in political education. Let them share, let them express themselves. Yogesh, a two point recommendation. My two point recommendation would be first one, meaningful youth engagement in uh, decision making process. Uh, uh, the youth of Global North and Global South and the youth across various spectrums of our society from top to bottom, urban youth and grassroots level youth should be provided with the platform where they can synchronize their ideas and create a harmonious and solid solidarity among them, which would be more democratic and inclusive as well. And other one, since I'm the member of parliament and I would like to focus more on the barriers which are refraining youths to become member of parliament or legislature uh, at the very young age. So I would like to pitch the resolution or pass uh, request to align the eligibility age of voting rights and the age, eligibility age criteria to resume the political office as well. So that in coming days, more and more youth parliamentarians like me and some others present here would be able to come into this sphere where they can decisively act upon the youth issues in coming days globally. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I uh, would now open um, to uh, open the stage to interventions. Any questions, comments? I uh, would like to hear from you. Uh, and I know for sure that there are there are a lot of youths in the audience. So I think it, it, you 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 just need to be a little energetic. I know it's it's quite late, but um, yeah. I'm over 46, so cannot be considered as a youth, <laughs> so pardon my question. Uh, you know, uh, youths are doing fantastic job, especially in the area of climate change, if we can uh, talk about Bangladesh, India, and this region. But uh, as with my colleague, Nezabin Khaled, we had been working with youth organization for almost a de over a decade now. And the main problem they are facing, they are very innovative, they are very, pers they have a lot of perseverance and they are trying. Main problem is financing. Because in the last section, you know, I could not raise this question, but if we find out that whenever there are youth organization driven initiatives, the main stumbles they face is financing. Whether it's from the government initiatives, whether it's from donor agencies, whether it's from other multi stakeholders, you know, we always say that youth is our future. They are doing very good at things, but whenever it comes to us politicians or even to bureaucrats or even to the donors, then we don't trust them. So the first thing is very important that we need to trust our youths. If we cannot trust them, the problem will not be solved. So I think they are the driving force to take bold step. You know, we, this the theme nature solves. And when we talk about nature solves, youths will be the main I would say uh, they, they will be the main uh, building blocks of these solutions. So I think uh, we all need to collaborate, especially uh, we have many initiatives in many regions. We need to have a more regional collaboration among youth organization, youth volunteers, and especially these initiatives needs to be taken by the governments. And also, you know, this kind of forum is a fantastic platform for youths and I, I, I think it would be better in the next, whenever you have this kind of gatherings in the next, you know, uh, formation or whatever, you know, you can bring more, uh, you know, youth organizations here where they can uh, share their ideas, where they can be encouraged and they can also, f they should feel that we trust them. You know, this word I'm again saying that if we cannot trust them, then they will not actually deliver the future we want from them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have two questions from the back. Could uh, hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Abhijit Sharma. 
we have initiated one of the largest uh, youth activations, which is called the Yes Earth Youth Corps Leadership Program. And uh, this aims at having 50,000 uh, youth leaders in the next one year. Uh, my question is, along with what uh, the gentleman stated, that financial support. But apart from financial support, uh, uh, support on information skills, uh, as well as representation on the World Forum is one of the larger activities. One of the gentlemen on the dais did say that uh, 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 there were suggestions given by youth, but they were not accepted. But I think with more representation from the youth, uh, who are the largest stakeholder in the future, uh, the, these summits will have to accept the recommendations. So we hope for the best. Uh, my question is like, what other supports the larger organizations like UN uh, or other organizations which are present today out here uh, would be ready to support in terms of the skills, uh, not just on funding? Who is your question to? Uh, uh, anyone can answer, actually. It's a common question. <laughs> Raymond, would you want Yeah, thanks. Look, um, it's, it's, it's a difficult question because, I mean, that's a question that needs to be answered by them. What we are saying is we are asking them, we are, you know, we are requiring them to invest in youth. So, um, I mean, speaking of the UN, um, it's, it's a world, it's a global organization which does not have a, a youth component. We have a youth envoy for 60% uh, of the world's population uh, run by one person. And it's only now that they are talking about at least a department, but it has to be maybe a council, even on youth, that will discuss youth issues. So, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if um, that's the question that any of us could answer here. Just uh, adding to that, I think uh, UN and all these international agencies spend a lot of money on advocacy and training and development. But also, if we can, so now in Sri Lanka is an ocean, and we have all the waste that's being dumped in the ocean, washing up on our shores. But, you know, our country, I have put forward many proposals asking foreign countries to help us buy, there's a machine called a beach cleanup, where you just hook it onto a tractor and you just drive it around. There are enough volunteers happy to do it. But I think if we can also look at more practical solutions, whilst I mean, advocacy and uh, planning and frame policy is important, but if there's money to actually do practical things also, you, using local councils or elected bodies, that will also be something that uh, you know, funding agencies can look at. Thank you. Uh, I have space for two more questions. I'll go to the gentleman at the back and then come to you, sir. Thank you very much. I think uh, thanks to ORF for organizing such an exciting. This is a session which one should attend. You know, thank you so much for the young MPs here. I just wanted to cite that youths can do many, many things. You know, uh, it's only a question of giving them participation, encouraging them, and bringing them with some kind of you know uh, support. I wanted to quote the example from Meghalaya again. Uh, under our project in Meghalaya Clam, uh, what the youth have done, they have. Divide, they have set up a center of drone assembly and making drones themselves. And it's not, it, I don't know, you always procure drones. But what they have done is they have established drone management center and finally integrating that their drone into the center of geo uh, tagging and all uh, geo information in the chief minister's cell. And as well, linking with the health schemes, forest management schemes, forest monitoring schemes. So I think we need to encourage them, and the day is not far when we will have you know, more than five sitting here, more than 100 would be uh, representing uh, in this nature uh, solutions. Thank you so much. I look forward to moderating that panel. Uh, I, um, I have one last question from the gentleman there. I mean, could, could somebody pass on the mic, please? For now, I'll just add one line that is like actually the youth they don't need to change. We need to change. We are not youth. We have to change our thinking process. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I am from Arunachal Pradesh, representing a youth organization, uh, Garungthuk, from the Eastern Himalayas. 
So uh, thanks to climate change, uh, today we are sharing the same GPS location <laughs> discussing on the climate change. So when the disaster hits, everyone is here. So now it's uh, pretty clear that uh, we have been hit by the disaster. <coughs> so one question to all the panelists, how many of you have walked through a primary forest? How many of you have walked through a primary forest? This is my first question. So why ask, why I say, ask this question because I, I feel that the pollution, those who are producing the pollution, they are not taking the responsibility of climate change. In the, all the panelists uh, from the morning I have heard it, you are pushing the solutions to the local communities who are not at all polluting the environment. So, <clears throat> uh, so definitely, uh, uh, this is just a passing comment. Let us uh, look to the local communities. Let us encourage them. Let them be part of the knowledge base rather than we thrashing the whole global statistics and uh, dumping huge waste and huge knowledge in local communities. Local communities have been there for ages. They have been like a living laboratory where there are many traditional knowledges. We have that have fought the climate changes of centuries. So let us uh, take all those into account. So my question still uh, is, stays there. How many of you have walked through the primary forest? Thank you. OK. So we are clearly taking home some homework. And when we come back next year, we should answer this question upright and straight and should be proudly walking through primary forest and have gained experience since then. Um, thank you, all of us. And I think we all deserve a big round of applause for being so disciplined and keeping up to time. Um, you've been a great